Uh, thank you, David. I want to congratulate you on your vision and, and pulling this together. It's been very much your baby, and uh, everyone's been looking forward to it. I certainly uh, hope to learn a lot from it. Um, since you're into golfing jokes, I, have to, I can't resist uh, one of my own because uh, uh, <coughs> I was uh, reminded of the fact that as one gets older, some of one's uh, talents uh, fade a little bit, and I heard this joke told by Bob Hope in person a long time ago. He was complaining that his golf game was going worse, but he talked about his friend who was still hitting the ball pretty well, but his eyesight was fading. Um, so he could actually hit the ball further than he could see it. And he, dis he discovered a friend of his who liked to go for a walk, didn't play golf, had good eyesight. So he said, why don't you come with me and tell me where the ball goes? So that seemed a good plan. So they set off on the first tee and he swung sounded good he said oh that felt good uh did you see where it went to his friend he said yeah i saw it he said where'd he go you know i've forgotten <laughs> 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 so i'm very pleased to be here uh at my age i'm pleased to be anywhere uh david has asked me to actually reflect on some of the early days uh, of endoscopy uh, and the pancreas and i'm going to speak a little bit about the first 20 years started for me in the 60s at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. This was the new hospital built in 1850 uh, until it was somewhat remodeled by a couple of giants of the 20th century. That was Adolf Hitler who knocked down most of the left of it and then Margaret Thatcher who squeezed the academics so strongly in, in London that it almost destroyed the medical school. Uh, but that's where I grew up as a a resident uh, and gradually worked my way into gastroenterology because it seemed to be the simplest specialty. Uh, it didn't seem to involve learning too much in the way of three-dimensional anatomy and most importantly there was no prospect of needing to get up at night or at the weekend to do anything because we didn't have any useful therapeutic uh, <coughs> uh, 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 activities at that time. Uh, <coughs> At that time, the pancreas was certainly a, a black box. Uh, there were no scans of any sort. Uh, we made our diagnoses in the old-fashioned way by palpation, diagnosed pancreatic cancer by feeling a mass. Uh, we saw cal calcification of the pancreas occasionally, chronic pancreatitis, of course. We diagnosed pancreatic cancer by the way a barium study looked a bit odd in the duodenum. And then, of course, by laparotomy and uh, finally autopsy. So it really was a very difficult time for, for the pancreas. Uh, <clears throat> it was at the same time that the first fibroscopes appeared. The first Olympus one, uh, commercially available, at least in England, uh, occur, uh, appeared in the, in the mid-60s. And I was at, attracted into endoscopy by this article that was published in the British Medical Journal uh, on the first Olympus gastroscope. And some of you in the audience might be surprised to see that that's actually a sideways viewing instrument, which um, nowadays we all use forward viewing instruments. Uh, and it was uh, because the Japanese were really only interested in the stomach and the best way of examining the whole stomach was to put this thing in, turn it around, and see the whole stomach. I was working uh, under the mentorship of Brian Kramer, whose photograph is there in what was called the gut hut, which uh, was a little research Quonset hut tacked onto the back of the hospital. And it became very obvious to him and to me that uh, my efforts at basic science were not likely to bear too much fruition. And I said, why don't we jump on this gastroscope thing? And I was fortunate that these first, uh, first paper appeared and we were able to get ourselves an instrument and get going with it. So. <clears throat> Uh, in uh, the beginnings of looking for the pancreas, we came across this article in The Lancet in 1966 by a uh, Scottish surgeon called Watson, and he claimed that that was the first direct vision of the ampulla of Vata, and sorry, it's a rather f fuzzy picture, but that's actually part of the point because we never really saw the, the original illustrations very well. He described, uh, and those photographs are supposed to show, the papilla ovata opening and closing after an injection of secretin, 
when I eventually got hold of an original uh, of this article, I discovered that what he was describing was actually the pylorus. So it, <coughs> we've stopped, stopped quoting that as the first site of the papilla ever since. First attempts of what is now called ARCP were made in the United States uh, at George Washington by a group of surgeons, uh, McCune being the first author. Uh, they used a, a modified gastroscope with some stuff screwed onto the side of it. They published one photograph, uh, didn't claim much in the way of success, but it really was a, a pioneering effort. As most people know, <coughs> the momentum moved rather rapidly to Japan. In the late 60s, Itaro Oi, Tokyo Women's Medical College, working with the Machida Company, and Kazuo Ayagoshi in Niigata, Japan, working with the Olympus Company, uh, <coughs> were able to develop a, a long side-viewing duodenoscopes with an elevator, which in, in, enabled them to actually find the papilla and, and enter it to, uh, to a certain extent. And this was uh, Itaro Oi presented to the World Congress in Copenhagen in 1970, which was really a sensation, if you think about it, at a time when there were still no scans of any sort. The idea that you could get inside the pancreas, and the bile duct for that matter, was a, an extraordinary revolution. And uh, it excited uh, many people in the audience, including uh, my mentor, Brian Kramer, who came back from that meeting and said, Peter, this is something we should get involved with in a hurry. And he managed to persuade the uh, British Cancer Research Council that we could probably stamp out pancreatic cancer if we bought one of these instruments and, uh, and, and an airfare to Japan. And I ended up going to Japan. Uh, another stimulus to that was from a, another pioneer, Meinhard Klassen from Germany, who gave a, a lecture at the British Society of Gastroenterology in 1970 with wonderful videos of the duodenum, which actually blew us all away. And I went to speak to him afterwards and said, how do we get involved in this? And he said, you go to Japan. And so, in fact, I ended up going to Japan. And this is, uh, <coughs> I spent two weeks with Kazuo Ayagoshi. Uh, and that shows my first rather pathetic attempt at a, 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 a successful attempt at an ERCP uh, over 40 years ago. Uh, my career in this field actually was almost aborted at the start because uh, Kazuo's boss, Professor Hara, was a very keen golfer, and he um, used to come to the endoscopy unit every day and says, we go play golf. I said, well, actually, I kind of would rather stay here, if you don't mind, sir, while watching some of this interesting stuff. And so he just slunk away rather upset um, and it did, uh, every day, and eventually we did go and play golf. And, he certainly was the worst golfer I've ever experienced, but then, uh, uh, anyway, dear man. But anyway, Kazo uh, was, was very sweet to me, and I was able to do some procedures, discover that it was indeed possible to find the papilla, which was actually quite difficult in those days, because the angle of view is about 40 or 50 degrees. It's now, you know, 360 almost. You, you can't miss the damn thing, but then it was tough to find it, but we eventually discovered it. We were able to master it, and I wrote my first paper on the, what became ERCP in 1972 in The Lancet. There's a little story here. This paper was actually published uh, with three weeks after I submitted it, which is kind of an unusual story, and it's because there was a mail strike on in London at the time, and I delivered the manuscript by hand through the mailbox of The Lancet, and a man came on, a, on his bicycle about a week later with the proofs to, around the corner to the hospital for me to correct, and it was published. So it may be as if there hadn't been a mail strike, uh, my career would have stopped uh, for, at, at that point. I was very fortunate in that regard. There was another very important meeting that I should acknowledge, and that is the Olympus Company put, brought together at the European Congress in Paris 1972, the, uh, the handful of people who were doing this stuff in Europe and a couple of Japanese that was very stimulating to us, uh, uh, enabled us to actually share our experiences and actually do some hands-on work in one of the hospitals in, in Paris. I remember it very well. There was skepticism uh, about this procedure in the United States at the time. John Morrissey, who was very influential in endoscopy, a marvelous man, uh, had this quote, that this procedure is possible only by Japanese musicians, and you can see Kazuai actually 
uh, was a musician. And in, in fact, it was true that several of the pioneers at the time were also musicians. Michel Kramer, a very close friend of mine, sadly passed, uh, played the cello, as you can see. And then we came across a French uh, gastroenterologist who we didn't, uh, who we assumed from the way he performed, obviously played the trombone because his technique was <laughs> and uh, in fact, I think uh, I saw the first perforation of the duodenum at his hands uh, at that meeting. Uh, <clears throat> there was another a key moment in the World Congress, 1974, it's where this group actually came together and agreed the term ELCP, which has is, which is stuck ever since. I have to say that up to that time, I had been uh, uh, encouraging it to be called pancreatic or biliary cannulation, uh, the initials being PBC that happened to be the same as mine. Uh, but unfortunately, some liver doctor had, had got PBC there ahead of me, so we had to stick with, with ERCP. So a lot of things happened in the 1970s. I don't go, obviously can't go into the detail with all of them, but as a result of the, the new images that we have, uh, there was a lot of descriptive stuff about what the normal pancreatogram looked like and what they looked like in diseases, and we struggled to try and develop some new uh, classifications uh, based on those. We rapidly, of course, discovered the fact that uh, this technique could actually cause pancreatitis as well as evaluate it. Uh, we're still struggling with that problem. And we spent a lot of time uh, discussing and testing the diagnostic value of pancreatography in comparison with traditional pancreatic function tests, which were quite popular at that time, including pure pancreatic juice studies that we did. I was involved at Middlesex Hospital in the very early days of, uh, of what was called grayscale ultrasound as a young gentleman called Bill Lees, who was an obstetric resident uh, who was doing a little thesis on on ultrasound in the physics department uh, in the context of, of, of obstetrics and gynecology. And he came to me one day and showed me some pictures of the gallbladder and pancreas. And he said, are you interested in these? I said, sure we are, that sounds terrific. And, uh, and he developed that and eventually changed careers, became a, a world famous radiologist. But also at the same time, the first CT scanners appeared. They were called EMI scanners at the time because they were developed by the EMI company, and actually my, the first patients ever to have body CTs were done uh, on my patients uh, in uh, Northwick Park Hospital around the corner from us by a radiologist called Louis Creel. So it's a very exciting time in the development of pancreatic diagnosis. And then we uh, got into this uh, <coughs> subject of pancreas divisum. Our group was one of the first to suggest that it was clinically important, a discussion which still rumbles on and is still awaiting uh, re more clarification. I do want to acknowledge uh, this gentleman, Solly Marks, uh, the godfather, grandfather of gastroenterology in Cape Town, South Africa, who had uh, been working away in chronic pancreatitis in South Africa. And uh, an article of his that appeared with Simi Banks in 1973 was really seminal and, and sparked a lot of interest as far as I was concerned, you can see that he, they were able to describe over a thousand patients followed for 12 years, uh, talked about the importance of alcohol, specific pancreatitis, etc. And visiting him was a very important experience for me and I'm thrilled that Flip Bournemouth is here from Cape Town who's followed in that tradition and standing on, on solid shoulders, a marvelous man, had so many great one-liners that I could entertain you with if I had a lot of time. So uh, let's move on from that because we're into uh, to a therapeutic era in the 70s. The first biliary sphincterotomies were done in Germany and in Japan in 1973, uh, published in 1974. And the first uh, stents were developed by Nibsa Hendra in Germany in, in 1979. That issued in a new era of therapeutic ERCP and uh, this was used in pancreatitis for the first time in managing biliary problems. So we described using urgent ERCP in patients with acute biliary pancreatitis. We thought that was being extremely helpful. That's in some doubt nowadays, as you know. Uh, and also we're able to apply stents uh, in patients with biliary strictures due to chronic pancreatitis. The first uh, actual pancreatic treatments 
Uh, I've been trying to research and I've been going back uh, with my friends from Europe. It looks as if the first one was one published in 1978 on actually minor papilla sphincterotomy, would you believe? Uh, this gentleman chose to publish it in a French journal, which has since gone out of, out of print, uh, called Endoscopy Digestive. But this seems to have been the first description that I can come across, at least uh, in English or French. Uh, one of the things that was going on at that time in Germany was because the idea that chronic pancreatitis burnt itself out, the idea came across that you could actually speed that up by blocking off the pancreatic duct. And Nipsohendra wrote about this in the late 70s, and these illustrations show the pancreatic duct in a number of patients before and one to three months after they put superglue of some sort up the pancreatic duct. Um, it showed in some cases the things that changed. I'm embarrassed to say that I did this myself half a dozen times and gave it up after we very carefully tested pancreatic function with a pancreatic secret and test, a tube test, and before and after this treatment, and the pancreatic function actually improved, which was somewhat to my surprise. But that went out of business rather, rather, rather quickly, although it was fashionable for a time. In the early, uh, early 80s, then, there was an avalanche of a description of uh, endoscopic therapy of the pancreas with pancreatic sphincterotomy and stenting. The first descriptions of uh, ESWL by Saarbrück in Germany and the first uh, reports of pseudocyst drainage. It would take me a very long time to review all of these papers. I don't intend to do so, but I will share with you the faces of some of those pioneers. I've already mentioned Klassen and Sohendra from Germany, Kramer from Belgium, and Claude Ligary from France. But uh, the other ones I show you, Case Hybrids are working with Guido Teitgart in Amsterdam, uh, Thomas Roche from Germany, Guido Costamagna from Italy, uh, Jose Sahel, who, who worked with Henri Saal, who's a great pancreatologist in Marseille, Jacques Devere in Belgium, Saarbrück, I've mentioned already. Laszlo Safrani is a great guy from Hungary who escaped from Hungary when it was behind the Iron Curtain, uh, ostensibly because he'd done ERCP on everybody in, in Hungary and needed to move on somewhere else. Uh, and then there were a couple of pioneers in the United States, uh, Joe Geenan and Dick Kozarek, who c contributed significantly too. I was very fortunate. I have to acknowledge the fact that I was uh, very fortunate in having colleagues at the Middlesex Hospital where I worked. Bill Lees, I've already mentioned on the left, the uh, ultrasonographer. Richard Mason, uh, the interventional radiologist when there were very few of those around. And on the right, one fantastic surgeon, Chris Russell, who was extremely helpful to me, uh, a wonderful surgeon. Each of the four of us has one of these pictures with, with each of us sitting in the fr front row as, as chairman of this group. But it was truly a, di a multidisciplinary uh, organization, a lot easier perhaps to organize in those days in, in England because nobody got paid anything and there weren't really any turf issues involved. So it enabled us to cross some of those traditional boundaries without too much difficulty. So by 1990, 20 years on, uh, there was a lot of ERCP pancreatic therapy being done all over the world in pretty much any clinical context that you could think of, but it was a, we were still lacking a, a little bit in terms of solid proof of efficacy. And I don't think a great deal has changed in the last 25 years as far as that's concerned. There have been a few seminal studies, uh, a few randomized controlled trials that have been helpful, but we are still looking for solid proof of e efficacy of a number of these interventions. And so I'm certainly hopeful that this meeting and the forthcoming book will add significantly to our knowledge in this area. I'm very pleased that everybody's here and I look forward to learning a great deal. Thank you.